We're continuing our study of John's gospel, moving into uh, this new series about the hour has come. And we have seen since uh, John 13, that John gives insight to these last few hours uh, of Jesus with his disciples before going to the cross, unlike any other gospel. Uh, this writing of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, started in chapter 13 and will go till chapter 19. So the amount of information we get in this, the amount of detail, the amount of teaching really is remarkable in John's gospel. We started chapter 14 last week, and in that we, we recognize the mood of the room is shifting a bit. There's a sorrow setting in. Jesus has talked about being glorified to the Father and the Father glorifying Him, being lifted up and of course, they knew what that meant. He's talking about his death again. He has had this conversation with them. They have not liked it, but it's really sort of setting in with them now. They know this is the time. They can read the community. They can read the situation. They know the aggression against Jesus is growing. And so it, you can sense that there's a sadness setting in the room. To that, Jesus starts chapter 14 by offering this great blast of hope. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm God. You believe in God, believe in me. And in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. I would have told you if that weren't true. I'm going to go prepare a place for you that you can live in my Father's house. And then we'll be there together because where I am, I want you to be also. And so it would seem like this is a great opportunity to celebrate. But then Thomas, you know, does what Thomas does. Thomas asks the questions that the other people are thinking, and even says we, so this is something they're discussing. Lord, we don't know where you're going. We, we don't. And how can we even know the way? To which Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So you would think maybe after that, when we get to verse 7 of chapter 14, now there's a celebration. All right, he is the answer. We don't understand it all, but we follow, we're following him and we believe in him. But verse seven does not show a celebration breaking out. Jesus continues to teach and continues to, to show them who he is and what this means for them, but he also has to correct their confusion about who he is and why he's doing what he's doing. And he gets to a kind of a theme in these verses we're going to look at, verses 7 through 15, where he's talking about believing. And as, as we're talking about the hour coming to the death of Christ, it was also he's telling his disciples, this is the hour for you to believe. And so today I want to show you the hour has come for Christians to believe. See, it's one thing for us to say to them, why didn't they get it? I mean, why didn't they get it? I mean, he... He was with them for three years. They saw him feed thousands of people, just creating food. They heard the way that he taught, and they knew that that was something that the, the religious ruling class couldn't handle. They saw him heal people, raise Lazarus from the dead. They, he walked on water. He just could tell a storm to stop, and it would stop. Why are they having so much trouble believing what he's saying? Well, they could rightly look at us and say, yeah, but we didn't know about the resurrection at this point. You do. We didn't have the canon of Scripture of everything God wants us to know. You do. So why is it today that in the realization of the resurrection and the, 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 the evidence of God's Word that we have all of this, why do we struggle with believing? Well, the hour has come for Christians to believe. John chapter 7 or 14, starting in verse 7. Let's stand. We'll honor the reading of God's Word. This is what the Bible says. If, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that's enough for us. Jesus said, have, have I... Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? 
The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. God, thank you for this truth, and thank you for our time to look at your word and learn from it. I pray that we would, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. There are many things we believe as Christians. There are many things that we're supposed to believe as Christians. There are some things we have to believe in order to actually be a Christian. I want to give you five pretty basic doctrines of the faith. Doctrine is a a bigger word for teaching. I want to show you five principal teachings of the faith that you've got to have in order to be a Christian. And here's the first. The Bible is God's Word. What I have just read to you comes comes to us from an authority, the Holy Spirit, working through John to give us this information. This is the information God wants us to have. These are the the guardrails for living, the information on, on how to live, the hope and the confidence that we have in Christ. This is God's Word. The second thing is we're saved by faith in Jesus. Praise be to God because of His remarkable grace that He would offer us an opportunity to be in a right relationship with Him through Christ, and that comes by faith in Christ. It seems like we should have to do more, but he's done all the work. We, by faith, trust him. The Bible tells us how to live, and we follow because we love him, because he's rescued us, and he's changed us, and the Holy Spirit indwells us, and and we're new people. And the third thing, there's life after death. And for the Christian, that life after death is in a perfect heaven, and you've got to believe that. Number four, Jesus is fully God and fully man. When he was here in his ministry, fully God, fully man. And then there's this, God is three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I saved those last two to say that if we're being honest, those last two really do kind of require a belief in something we don't fully understand. I have heard, I, I don't know if I've heard every illustration that man can come up with to explain the Trinity, but I've heard a lot of them, and they're, they're fine-ish, but I think there are faults and failures in all of them. I think the, the best way to understand the Trinity, and others have said this as well, is to be humble enough to understand that you don't really understand the fullness of the Trinity. It's a remarkable thing, and I, how can someone be fully God and still be fully man? How can there be three equal parts of God that can operate in perfect unison while operating differently in the flesh and still being in heaven? How how is it that there's this Trinitarian doctrine that says God is one being that operates in three distinct persons? How is that possible? How am I supposed to understand that? And I'm I'm told to believe it because the Bible writes about it as, well, this is it. I mean, this is what it is. We'll, we'll, We'll get to the third part next week when we talk about the Holy Spirit. But Jesus speaks to it as it is fact. Jesus speaks to it in an affirming way. And and we read this knowing the, the reality of the resurrection. So that maybe makes it easier for us. It made it easier for them to understand. And there's still this expectation that we would believe in something we don't fully understand. The Bible's honest about it. God's ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours, but we don't really understand them. In fact, I'm, I'm in agreement with commentators that would say, even when we get to heaven and we're in the state that we are in heaven, that even then we won't understand it. Even then we won't fully understand the Trinity. It, it's a remarkable thing, and yet we are told to believe it. And here's the thing. Those of you who are Christians and you've been Christians for a while, you're growing in the faith. You do believe it, even though you don't really understand it, right? 
You know, you're with me, right? The, there is the Holy Spirit indwelling you that enlightens you to the truth of this that you didn't have on your own. How does that happen? I don't know. And, and then the, he guides you and prompts you and directs you. You know this because when you by faith came to Christ and started to grow in the, in the joy of your salvation and the truth of your salvation, you started to see things differently. You acted differently. Things sounded different. They moved you in different ways. And as you continue to grow, you see this developing process happen. It's remarkable. And that is for the believer and for the true believer. And I would argue that there are many people who say that they're Christian, but they... They like to the idea of cultural Christianity, but they're not really Christian because they don't really believe. And that, that belief is not developing and growing. So I want, to give you, I want to give you three things that I think are also basic, what we see from the text, to give you a little belief check. Because believing Christians know His ways. Believing Christians know His ways. Look at verses 7 through 11. I love that Philip speaks. Philip is, is a guy that it, he doesn't get a lot of airtime in the Bible, but I've always liked just sort of the idea of Philip because when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, 5,000 men, there could have been 15,000, could have been 20,000 altogether, and he just invents food. It's one of my favorite Bible stories. Philip is the guy that he turns to and asks a question. I love that. You're from the area. How do I feed all these people? Philip is an interesting guy because when we, when, I'm going to just give me a second to back up and give you sort of a, uh, who Philip is, because we don't hear about him a whole lot. Philip is a guy that is from the same area, Bethsaida, as Andrew and Peter. And, and so he, he's a guy that we would have known about John the Baptist and teachings of John the Baptist. He's been looking for the Messiah. And as we see in John chapter 1, verses 44 through 46, we get the first quote uh, from Philip. So Philip is from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, Nathaniel's not as excited. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That doesn't shake Philip. Well, come and see. I think he is. So come and see. Great start. Feeding of the 5,000. Jesus turns to Philip, says, where are we going to get the food? Notice now we're deeper into the ministry. He has seen Jesus already do remarkable things, but he seems to think there's a limit on what Jesus can do. So we see in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, therefore Jesus lifting his eyes and seeing the large crowd coming says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Verse 6 says, Jesus was saying this to Philip because he himself knew that he was intending to do. He's testing Philip. Why would, he, why would he need to test Philip? Is Philip's faith a little weak? It's not uncommon for Jesus to say to the disciples, your faith is weak. What's going on in Philip's life that Jesus, why to specifically pull him out? You know, you're the guy who was so excited when I came. I sense now in you, Philip, there's something missing. So, hey, Philip, where are we going to get money to feed all these people? You know the area. It would have been great if the quote would have been, Lord, you can do it. Well, that wasn't the quote. Philip said, um, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for even to receive a little. There isn't enough money. There's no way we would have enough money to feed all of these people. We're not going to be able to do it. And then we see sort of a crack, this idea that I, I'm following you, but you're doing things that don't make sense. I'm following you, but you're doing things I don't understand. I'm following you, but my belief level isn't where it should be. And Jesus was right to test him. And now here we are, hours before the crucifixion. Philip speaks again, it's quoted in the Bible. It's unusual, right? Because Peter's the one who does all the talking, right? But he's already spoken. And Peter said, I would lay down my life for you, Lord. And Jesus said, no, you won't. Not tonight, you won't. Well, you'll do it later, but not tonight. You'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. So maybe Peter's thinking, okay, I'm going to sit this one out. Thomas has already spoken. We don't know the way. How can we know the way? Jesus, I am the way. So maybe Thomas thinks, maybe I should sit this one out too. So it's up to Philip. And Philip speaks for the group and says, unfortunately, just show us God. That'll be enough. 
I don't understand. I'm following you. You're doing these amazing things. But now you're asking me to believe. So I, I'm not there. So if you want me to believe, show me God. Now, you've probably done things like that before, right? I mean, I have. I, mean, I remember early in my life when I when thought about being a Christian, maybe wanting to be a Christian, was curious about Christianity. God, just speak to me. Then I'll believe it. You just speak to me. Write it up in the sky. Then I'll believe I remember when I was a little, little kid, and, and God was a, a concept, I guess, that I liked. I had a great little kid's Bible that I loved, had great pictures in it, and I wanted to fly because who? what kid doesn't want to fly? And I remember thinking, you know, if I just tell God I love him loud enough, maybe he'll let me fly. And so I took off running in the yard, Jesus, I love you! And I jumped, and I was not defying gravity. I came right back down. But there have been times, and maybe there have been times in your life you thought, Lord, I, I need to hear from you right now. I need to hear your voice right now because I'm following. I'm trying to believe. I need you to show me something super special. And in this moment, that's what Philip says. I, you, you're, if you're going to die in a few hours, you're going to have to show me, God. I don't understand it. Make it easier for me. Let me see you. Now, Again, we can give Philip a little bit of grace, right? Because he doesn't know the resurrected Christ yet. This is all very confusing to him. We can offer you a little bit of grace too because, you know, sometimes things get tough in the spiritual walk that you're making. But he didn't have the canon of Scripture, and you do. You want to know what he thinks? Read the book. You feel lonely? You feel like he's not there? You feel like you need to hear from him? Read the book. You want some comfort? You want some encouragement? You want some hope? Read the book. If you are, by his incredible grace and through faith, saved, pray. You have an access to him through prayer. Use it. If you're, you're feeling like I, he's just got to do something great, he doesn't have to do anything else. If he saved you, he didn't have to do another thing for you. And if those things are real in your life, and if the Holy Spirit indwells you believing Christians, you could, because maybe your faith is still weak and their faith is still weak, you could say, I need help. You could be like the man, I, I believe, help with my unbelief. You could, you could say, I need help growing, but you don't need to say, would you just open up the sky and you and me have a talk that nobody else hears? Come on. He's indwelling you. How much closer do you need him? So if he's, if he's not there, then you have a whole nother issue, right? Then you have a whole nother issue. Well, I just, I don't believe, I don't, if I don't see him, I'm not going to believe him. You're not, a, you're not a believer then. We'll get more on that in just a little bit. Here's the second thing. Verse 12 sticks out. Believing Christians know greater things. The reason verse 12 sticks out, it has to. Jesus says, truly, truly. Well, you better stop when Jesus says that. This is an emphatic truth that he wants to get across, but it is a remarkable, emphatic truth. If you believe, you'll do greater things. What? This is not to say that you will be more sinless than him. You won't. This is not to say that you'll be a better teacher than him. You won't. This is not to say that you'll be more all-knowing than him. You won't. This is not to say that your life is more meaningful than his. It isn't. This is not to say that your death could rescue humanity, because it can't. But why does he say you'll do greater things? Jesus, when he was here in human form, Jesus has had a, a spatial, I say spatial, there's a space he could be in, and that space he could be in is where he was. The ministry of Jesus, that three-year ministry of Jesus, covered an area the size of about New Jersey, and he didn't even travel to all of it. There was, there was a limit because of what he was there to do, to how long he was going to be there. And he's saying to them, as he's been saying to them, I'm turning the ministry over to you. You will reach more people. The birth of the church will bring about remarkable things to the glory of Christ. The message of Christ, the gospel of Christ being spread in even greater ways, 
meaning the number of people that can be reached, the world that can be reached. I, I mentioned in the last service, too, I mentioned Billy Graham never made claims about himself necessarily. Everything pointed back to Jesus, everything. His ministry was about Jesus. It was about opening the book, reading the book, explaining the book. How did Jesus use him? Jesus allowed that man to be the vessel of Christ to reach more people than Jesus did in his speaking, speaking to larger crowds, being in more places around the world. Jesus used him, a man who was faithful, to just talk about Jesus. Well, let's, let's lower the scale quite a bit. This is being transmitted out. It's hard, hard to believe. Becky mentioned Rick in Missouri who watches every Sunday. There are other parts around the world that watch. That's remarkable. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's an incredible reach, and it's, it's odd and unusual and humble to think about, except for the fact that it's only valuable if it's about Jesus. There are a lot of people who have great reach, can reach all the world, but if it's not about Jesus, it's not considered by him something even greater, more people to be reached. The technology we have now is just ridiculous. I don't know if you know this, but now apparently there is a ship that is ready to be built or has been built that can take human beings to Mars. Now, I don't know who needs to be evangelized in Mars. I don't think anybody. But maybe you can evangelize the people in the capsule with you as you're in air, in space for three years or whatever. It's, I would totally go. I'm blown away by technology. Do you know this? I got a new phone yesterday. I can, now this is going to shock you, some of you. I can pay for stuff on my phone. I can, yeah, right. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? I can take my phone and just go like that and like something, they go like whatever they do and I paid for it. I don't have to pull out money and I pull out a card, nothing. I went out yesterday with Jake and I'm like, okay, now how, how does this, because I left my cards at home, how does this, I mean, except I got one card, the other cards are at home. How do I do this? He goes, Dad, you, you, we just showed you. We just, you call it up, you hit it, it pops up, you just hold it up to the thing, you know, where you hold your card thing, and it just poof. And I said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for that yet. I got to ease into it, man. You know, right now, our, because we are able to send money, like, around the world, there are people meeting around the world with money that you have provided for the ministry. I mentioned last week all the churches in Mexico, Colombia, and El Salvador. I, I didn't mention this to you that there's also not only do they get money that pays for pastors, but Pastor Miguel has started an online ministry to teach, working with a seminary in the area. So all of those pastors are getting the doctrine. Why does it? Why does that matter so much? Because anyone can get up and talk, but unless it's about Jesus, then it doesn't really have eternal value. So starting a church in Mexico or Colombia, El Salvador, Africa, all of that's great. But if they're not able to articulate what this book says with some sort of guidance and the indwelling and leading of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's if it's not about Jesus, it's not valuable. And and so the idea of reaching a greater audience and reaching more people, it matters if it's about Jesus. And Jesus says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, if you really believe the message that I'm going to give you, if you'll share the message I'll give you, oh, you'll reach bigger than New Jersey. And here's the third thing, and we'll be finished. Believing Christians follow his plan. Verses 13 through 15, this is something. Whatever you ask, you get. Wait a minute. Verse 13, pray in my name, you'll get it. Just as sure as I am Son of God. Verse 14, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, here we go, right? I mean, you've been to those churches, maybe heard about those churches. Name it and claim it, man. You just say it and say his name and you'll get it. Now, let me ask you something. When that doesn't work, what do those churches say? You didn't have enough faith. You would have had more faith, you could have named it and claimed it. Then what's the next step they take? Here's how we can see your faith. Just give us more money. If you give us more money, then that shows your faith because you got to have great faith to give up your money. You give up great faith to show your money. This is the old trick from the early days of the church, the sad, pitiful days of the church. When when the, the church, thank goodness for the Protestant Reformation, 
we're the original protesters. Thank you that we protested when we saw this. This idea that say, you want to get grandma into heaven? Give us some money. We'll pray her in. Indulgences is what it was called. And, and even before that, in the medieval times, you had the state that would go to the church and say, we need to fuel what we're doing here, so we need to know who to tax, so you need to help us out. So then the church said, came up with this, that said, hey, look, if you don't get baptized, you don't go to heaven. If your babies don't get baptized, you don't go to heaven. So people are running, here, here's my baby, here's my baby, here, here's my, and they're documenting all the babies and then handing the information to the state so the state knew who to tax. Well, that's not good. So if you were able to say, anything I want, anything I want, I call out to Jesus and he's going to do it? <laughs> no. Because no. what would you ask for? What would people ask for? Well, I want all the money. No. If I, could, if I could say it and it's going to happen, if I could name it and claim it, the Buckeyes would never lose another game. <laughs> we wouldn't have to recruit a punter. We'd never have to punt. I mean, no one in my family would ever get sick. No one in my family would ever die. I mean, we, we would just keep doing it. We just keep, because I would just name it, claim it, say it. Here's the key to what Jesus said. In my name means according to my will. And as it goes on to say, love me and keep my commands, in my name is what would Jesus pray? What does Jesus want? What is the will of the Lord? Because if I'm praying that, yeah, he wants to see that happen. Lord Jesus, I, I by faith trust you to be my Lord and Savior. I don't understand everything, but I understand this. I need you to come into my life and change my life and save my life. And I, I offer myself to you. Would you please forgive me my sins? Would you please rescue me? He will say yes. Pray in Jesus' name. Would you, would you help me to understand your word more? Would you give me a desire for your word that I'd, I'd have a desire to want to know it and share it? God, would you, would you give me an opportunity to speak with that coworker? And would you give me the knowledge of what to say? Would you give me the opportunity to give praises to you by the way I live my life, by the, by the way I speak, by the way I interact with other people? Would you? He wants to say yes to that prayer. If you're praying in my name, you're praying for my will, you're desiring the things that Christ wants, does he want that to happen? Yes. Problem, we, we see that, and so many churches see that and say, name it and claim it, baby, whatever you want. That is not it. Not about what I want. It's about what he wants. And when I pray about what he wants, now we're in line. By the way, the disciples, this got way easier for them. Because after the resurrection, everything changes. After the resurrection, they now they got it. Thomas took a little while longer. Don't you love Thomas? Thomas, Thomas, eight days, eight days later, they've already seen Jesus. They've seen the guys, they've good. He's alive! He's alive! And Thomas is like, yeah, until I can put my finger there, until I can put my hand here, I don't believe. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I mean, Judas is gone, so you would think that the other guys, he could believe, but no, I don't believe it. Eight days later, Jesus shows up. Put your, go ahead, put your finger there. Go ahead, put your hand here. Go ahead. Don't be unbelieving, be believing. And in, in verses 20 and 29 of John chapter 20, Thomas answers and says, look at, here we go. Here's the connection. My Lord, you have great power. My Lord, you're, you teach in ways I, I, I can't understand. You, you're doing things. I, my Lord, you have power. My, you, have, you, you, you have authority. And then there comes the connective conjunction. You are my Lord and God. This is what he was saying in the upper room. It's what he was saying. It's just what he was saying in the Last Supper. It's what he was saying. You believe in God, believe in me. I'm in the Father. The Father is in me. Philip goes, we don't understand that. And then Thomas sees it. My Lord and my God. Then Jesus says to him, because you see me, you believe. Then look, at this. that's my favorite part of this. 
Blessed are they who didn't see and believe. That's us. That's us. I didn't see him. I've never heard his voice. I've never heard his voice. I've never had a vision of him. Never, never had um, all those times I asked for him to write in the sky. He never did it. The little kid asked me to fly us and fly. Never let me fly. Never. I wonder, wonder what, let me ask you, let me just think, I think about these things from time to time. It's 12 o'clock. We got time. Um, when Lazarus died the second time, what do you think they prayed then? You know, when he was got ready to die, you know, they, hey, get Jesus, get Jesus. He's going to die in four days. He's dead. And then Jesus is not dead anymore. I wonder when he died the next time, I wonder what they prayed. Bring him back? No, I don't think so. By the way, if, if I get to the point where, you know, like, let's say I make it to 80, that'd be unusual for justices. Let's say I make 85. Whew, that's deep for justices. If I get to be like, if I get 90 and they say, you know, he's got a week, don't pray for me to live. <laughs> don't, 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 oh Lord, don't let him go. Because if I'm able to speak, no, Lord, let me go. Because my hope's not here. My, my desires aren't here. My eternity is not here. My joy is ultimately with Him. And so my prayers should be in honor of Him. Ask me whatever you want. As long as I have breath in my lungs, Lord, would you use me to share your message? God, would you help me remain faithful so I don't do anything that discredits the high calling you've given me? God, would you, would you orchestrate in such, would you move in ways that I could continue as long as you give me the mind and the ability to do it? Would you let me do this in a way that honors you? Lord God, would you answer that prayer? Because that's all I really need. Believing Christians follow his plan. What is his plan for your life? I'm sure it includes growing in him. I'm sure it includes surrendering to him. I'm sure it includes following him. I'm sure it includes believing him. Stand with me and let's close in a word of prayer. It, we're going to sing in a minute and give you the time to come forward. Maybe you want to come because maybe there's something you want to pray about someone you want to pray for, whatever it is, the altar will is down here in the front. There's padded areas you can kneel if you'd like. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about being a Christian. Look, I don't, I don't understand all this, but see the cool thing about this? Here's the cool thing about what I do for a living. This is so cool. The Holy Spirit, when you, you read this and explain it, the Holy Spirit takes that information and goes right to you with whatever your specific needs are. Because I don't know what they are, but He does. So sometimes like people say, wow, I feel like he's talking right to me. I'm not. He is. And so he can take it and come right to you and prompt you. And maybe that's what he's done today. Praise be to God. And so maybe you want to come and, and pray about something. That'd be great. Here's what will happen at Lee Park. Someone will come and put their hand on your shoulder and, and just to let you know you're not alone. And if you want to pray with them, take their hand. They'll kneel down. They'll pray with you. If not, just... Keep right on praying. Know that we love you. Know that we're a part of this community together. And if you want to stay there and sing, Miss Brooks is going to sing a song that you know. And I'm going to sing with her. I can't sing like her, but I'm going to sing with her. Because there are great truths in the words that she's going to be singing and great honor to the one we're going to be singing to. God, thank you for the opportunity we have to respond. I pray that the way we do it, whether we pray where we are, we come forward and pray or sing with great passion. We want you to be pleased. God, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And so now we praise you and pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen.